So Paul's here to talk about practical framework abstraction. Yes, thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Here we go. Um, so yes, I'll be here talking about practical framework abstractions, specifically separating business lo logic from frameworks and kind of tying that into maintaining legacy applications. Um, so my name is Paul Ross. I work in the greater Boston area with Compose Systems. We're a small consulting firm. There's five of us. Um, we're all really passionate about well-crafted code, writing code that adheres to solid design principles. Um, we also like open source code. So we've got a lot of open source packages that are available free to use. Um, the code I'll be showing is open source as well, although it's kind of simple, silly example, so it's not super useful. Um, one note to the organizers, um, something I just, I added this slide while I was sitting in the back. Um, I think it might be useful to provide a way for people who are presenting to coordinate their presentations with each other, because I've, I've noticed some similarities between what I'm going to talk about, what you were talking about, and I also, um, so back there, I'm not sure your name, but I saw he's got an exact same slide as I have. So it might be um, just a, a useful tool to be able to say, these are the presentations. Hey, we're presenting on a similar topic. Let's see if we can coordinate some of the ideas that we're gonna talk about. Um, just a, a thought, I wanted to put this here before I forgot about it. I had another thought too. Uh, you guys are sponsors, so just so everybody knows, I don't know if that was clear, but yes, I'm composed IO. So. Um, so a quick question, I kind of want to pull the room um, what does everyone in here do? So like how many people in here work for a software consulting company of some sort or whether it's their own? Looks like most of the people, maybe half. And how many people work for say a private company where the software development you're doing is specifically for that company? That looks like maybe a 50-50 split. Um, for those of you who do consulting, is the focus primarily automated tests? Show of hands a little bit. And how many people do like more control systems based um, end product? A little split? Okay. So it seems like there's a pretty good split of private company consulting, automated tests, and control systems. Um, so we, what we at Compose Systems do is largely control systems or helping companies build new products and write the software for those products and bring them to market. We don't really do any automated tests. Um, there's very little instrument crossover from project to product, project. Um, like I said, very little automated tests. And everything I'm going to be discussing is kind of appropriate for the type of applications that we write. Um, may not necessarily be appropriate for the types of applications you write if you do something totally different. If your main job is writing modules that are gonna be called from test stand, some of this stuff probably doesn't make any sense for you, and that's okay. Um, so getting right into it, what is a framework? Um, here's a Wikipedia definition of a framework. I like to think of a framework as a set of implemented solutions to commonly recurring software problems. Um, usually it's functionality that can be extended for particular use cases. And there's a bunch of frameworks out in the LabVIEW ecosystem. Um, heard about it, some of them already this morning, the DQMH, the Actor Framework. We at Compose Systems use the MVA Framework, which is an extension of the Actor Framework. Um, and what is an architecture? So a software architecture is different from framework. Um, an architecture is really the design that's specific to that particular application. An ar architecture may use a framework, but they're not quite the same thing. Um, specifically, an application has an architecture, that is the design of that particular application, um, and it uses a framework. And what is business logic? Um, you could probably find a lot of different definitions for this. To me, it really comes down to why. Why does this application exist? What is it there to do? Why um, does a customer want you to write this software? So is it to test a product? Is it a control system? Um, is it an interface to hardware? Is it analyzing data results? What does it do? What is the reason this application exists? That's the business logic. What is an abstraction? Um, so here's a generic definition of an abstraction. I've highlighted the, the part that I think is useful. Uh, the goal of abstracting data is to reduce complexity by removing unnecessary information. 
Um, abstraction layers in LabVIEW. I know that when I started using LabVIEW, started learning object-oriented programming, the way that I learned about abstractions was this right here, a abstract hardware device followed by a child that's maybe a particular type, followed by a concrete, say, DMM device. Um, and I think that's probably how most of us who learned object-oriented programming through LabVIEW kind of learned about abstractions. Um, with what we do, this type of design is not very useful. It may be useful to you if you write automated test equipment, uh, but for me, it's not really useful and it's not really how I use abstractions. Um, the way I like to think about abstractions, which maybe is a little bit different, um, are these two kind of use cases here. One is that an abstraction can be used as an interface or a boundary between modules of code. Um, similarly, an abstraction can be used as a wrapper around a vector of change. Um, and one quick note, so on interfaces, we have interfaces in LabVIEW. Um, in the software development world, com computer science world, um, there is a difference, subtle, not so subtle, difference between an abstraction and an interface. Um, I am not talking about LabVIEW interfaces when I talk about an interface. I am talking about an interface as in a layer or a, a line in the sand between two modules. Um, so how does all this relate to framework, frameworks? Um, so again, an abstraction can be used as an interface or boundary between modules of code. Um, so we can create an abstraction that is a layer between our business logic and the framework that we're using. Um, so framework abstraction would be a layer between your framework and your business logic um, that kind of separates them. Similarly, as an abstraction can be a wrapper around a vector of change, we may use an, a, an abstraction to wrap our framework because we may want to change the framework or the framework may change without our input. Um, so why do we want that boundary? Well, for one, most of us probably didn't write the framework that we're using in a particular application, right? Anybody here work on an application where you wrote the framework specifically for that application? Nobody, right? Um, so one person, one person out of the group, one, two. Um, the majority of people, well, okay, but um, so are you still the active maintainer of that framework? Uh, to, some extent, yeah. to some extent, one of them or the, the sole one? So the point here is that the framework was most likely, there are some edge cases, most likely was not written specifically for the use case that it's being used in. And more often than not, you're not the person who wrote the framework. You're not the person who's gonna drive changes in the framework. If someone decides they wanna modify how that framework works, that's kind of out of your control if you didn't write it. Um, and really what it comes down to is this last line here. Tightly coupling your application to the framework forces your business logic to adapt to the framework instead of adapting the framework to the business logic. And I think you guys mentioned this um, in your presentation that the framework you choose drives the design. What I'm gonna suggest is that the design should either drive the framework or should um, you should adapt the framework to the design. Uh, I worked, uh, this is a different customer than what I just talked about. Um, they, somebody else wrote a framework that was tightly coupled to their application. They had several similar applications that all used the same framework. Mm -hmm. And one of the big challenges was, because it was all tightly coupled, is that there's no way to update or fix bugs in the framework without visiting all 10 applications independently and fixing them all probably in slightly different, unique ways because everything's so tightly coupled to the business logic. So yep. that's why I think it helps motivate doing that abstraction of some sort. Yep. You seem to be dancing around a three-letter acronym, and I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it keeps jumping up in my head, is an API, an application programming. Are you getting to that, or is there a reason that you're avoiding it? Because when you think about, we all deal with APIs all the time, right? As an that, is a, that is that boundary layer, and so mm -hmm. it seems like you're trying to avoid that when it was like an absolute definition of what you're trying to deliver. Um, no, that's kind of exactly what I'm gonna get to is that um, when you um, write software, I'll, I'll kind of get into an example. Um, 
and then I'll get to your question. But yes, generally, um, you should write APIs for the functionality you want and then call those APIs into a framework somehow or plug the framework into those APIs. Isn't the framework underneath the API that you're talking about? Or the, framework, right? the API should... Um, it, 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 when we talk about underneath, in between, it kind of gets mixed up, and I think maybe it'll be a little bit more clear once I get into um, a little bit more details. Uh, but yeah, th those words kind of mush, and it, it's, it's hard to separate. I think the key thing here is that the API um, should not depend on the framework, or should not, um, the design of that should not be forced by the framework. Your words, an application has a and uses a framework, they sound kind of object oriented. Is yes. that intentional? Yes. Uh, but it, all everything that I'm going to talk about um, doesn't necessarily have to be object oriented. I'm going to show some examples of um, ways that you can create these layers without object oriented code. But everything that we do is pretty much object oriented. So yes, I'm going to be talking about things through that perspective. Um, and one side note on this, everything that I'm going to talk about is kind of a general rough idea, things that float around, um, reflections on applications that I've written that I've kind of looked back and like, hey, this could have been done better. None of these things are hard rules or concrete rules. I'm not going to try and convince anyone to use our frameworks or to go crazy creating these boundaries in their applications. Rather, what I'm going to suggest is that this is all stuff you should be aware of. Um, if you write code and it is tightly coupled to a framework, that's potentially okay, but it's something to be aware of. It's to, something to be aware of the fact that um, going forward, you're going to be coupled to this framework. This framework may change without your input. That may affect um, the life of the application, things like that. So this is really all just kind of um, stuff to think about rather than any kind of concrete um, hard rules. So getting into legacy applications, who here as part of their job kind of regularly maintains an application that they did not write, and that's maybe older than five years old. Good chunk of the crowd. Um, so me personally, what I do, um, as I said, we're consultants. We have a few different customers that we all work on. Me, I have one of my customers is a customer that has several legacy products that we just maintain and add new features to. The original code was probably written almost 15 years ago. It went through a major refactor maybe eight years ago. Um, and then it's been kind of maintenance ever since then. Um, the other projects that I work on are usually ground up, starting from scratch, new product development. Um, so kind of the same question I think that Brian had. So. For those who do maintain legacy software, um, or if you are have a new client comes to you with legacy software and asks you to add a new feature, is there an approach that people usually take? No one? Yeah. Yeah, I would um, make recommendations Right, take a look at the code, like Brian said, take a whatever, four hours, two days, whatever it takes. And then I would say 95% of all of them would say, no, we just want this one little thing. So then I will write as you know, much code as I want or need that's really cool, but I won't touch anything but just the, the spot. I mean, it's just the reality of that kind of job. Mm -hmm. The other part of that is charging appropriately because there is a bunch of risk there. So you, depending on how you're handling that, you want to make sure you account for that somehow. So those answers and kind of something that I was, I was thinking about during Brian's presentation, I think a lot of this comes down to your relationship with the customer and the level of trust that you have between each other. Um, so if a customer comes to you and it's a brand new customer and you tell them that their code is garbage and it needs to be scrapped, they're probably not going to trust you. Um, if it's a customer you've been working with successfully for many years and they want a new feature and you say, listen, the old architecture, just it's going to be a nightmare to do this. We should refactor this entire component. Um, so if there's that good layer of trust there, um, it, the, the back and forth kind of goes a lot more smoothly. 
actually found sometimes the opposite. Sometimes like they know their code is crap. And so if you tell them that up front, they're like, yeah, we knew that. And that like builds some trust as opposed to if you're like, oh yeah, it's not so bad. We can make that change really easily. And then they look at you like, this guy has no clue what he's doing because this is a mess. So yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely um, think that you should always be honest with customers. Um, if the code is crap, tell them that it's crap. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you try and sell them on a rewrite from the beginning. Um, sometimes it's good to do a little chunk of work, establish that trust, say like, we told you your code's crap. We can update it in a crappy way or we can do a better job. Um, you develop the trust and kind of go from there. I have a unique approach to that. I never tell anybody their code's crap. I run VI analyzer on it, give them the report and say, NI says your code's crap. <laughs> Back to the being honest part, I think part of it is just acknowledging the risk and making that clear to them, making like, well, I can make this one change, but I can't guarantee that it's not going to break other things when I do that. And so yep. therefore, you have to be prepared for that. Yeah, and there, there's definitely, um, I, I generally don't tell a new customer their code is crap. I kind of go through and tell them about software design principles and say like, here's where some flaws in your code are. Here's a design principle and here's why your code doesn't adapt to that design principle and here's why that's a problem and why it's gonna make a problem in the future. So um, maintaining legacy applications, we've all seen this image a hundred times. Um, and when we pick up old code, um, we, the instinct is often to look at it and say, this old code is crap. Um, and why is that? Well, we all like to write code um, and there's something about LabVIEW that at least for me and I think for my coworkers, um, we all talk about that there is something aesthetically pleasing about well-written LabVIEW code. We like to look at a block diagram that looks nice. Um, and sometimes you look at someone else's code and it's just a style you don't like. Um, and so you kind of instinct instinctually go to the idea that the old code sucks. Um, and part of that is because reading code is not as fun or easy as writing code um, and reading someone else's code is less fun and reading someone else's code in a style you don't like written in a way you don't like is the least amount of fun. Um, so on that note, this is a blog post that I think probably a lot of people in this room are familiar with. If you are not, take a note to um, write down Joel on software, things you should never do and go read this blog post. It's about five minutes. Um, it is well worth your time to read um, it is kind of going through the, the idea that the old code actually doesn't suck. Um, there's a reason that it's um, so complicated and that reason is that it's been used for 10 years and that there's all sorts of edge cases and those edge cases come about when an application has been used for a year and um, it's used in a way you didn't think about. And so all the little ugly parts of the code are actually bug fixes and they're useful. Um, and so it's something to be aware of when you look at an old application and you instinctually jump to like, this is bad, we need to refactor it, we need to design. Um, be aware of that um, instinct and be aware of the fact that a lot of times it's wrong. To add, if you're into working with legacy code, there are two podcasts that are really worth listening to. And one is called Legacy Code Rocks and the other one is called Maintainable. Uh, and they both talk about a lot of these things and they're both very good. So don't want to derail things, just wanted to mention that. So kind of getting into legacy applications, framework abstractions, um, how does this kind of tie together? Um, sometimes legacy application really is bad. Sometimes the framework it uses is fundamentally flawed. It's got terrible components in it, like flushing queues, previewing queues. You send it a message, you have no idea whether or not that message is actually gonna execute. Um, sometimes it's not. And I'm not here to convince you any one particular framework is better than another or that you should use ours or anything like that. Um, what I want to kind of convey is that when you're maintaining a legacy application or adding new features to a legacy application, you should kind of think of it um, from the perspective of a slow moving ship and what is the direction that ship is gonna go into. So if you add a feature say you wanna have a long-term relationship with a customer, which I think you should. Um, our customers are mostly long-term relationships and um, I think that's the best way to go because there is that trust built back and forth. And so when you have a customer who um, asks you how long something's gonna take and you say it's gonna take this long, they believe you. Um, and when it goes longer than expected and you tell them there's good reason for that, they believe you. So it, it's good to have a long-term relationship with customers. And part of that is kind of looking 
further down the road than this next particular feature. Um, so adding new features, um, a few questions to ask yourself. Um, is the framework actually bad? Is it fundamentally flawed or is it just not the one that you would wanna use? Um, was it written by someone who is no longer around? Is it no longer being maintained? Um, so if there are bugs in it, are you gonna be kind of branched off on this own framework on your own? Um, well, continuing to use this legacy framework, put that application in a worse state several years down the road um, than steering the, the application in a different direction. Even if it means that this new feature that you add seems kind of wonky, seems kind of out of place because the whole thing is say a um, queued message handler and then now you're adding something else that's not a queued message handler. Um, if you think of it from the perspective of where's this gonna be several years down the road, um, that's kind of the perspective that I like to take. Um, and regardless of the answers to any of these questions, I think you should plan the feature from the business logic first perspective. Um, exactly the question here, the API perspective. Um, build the feature the way the feature should be built. Um, so what is the new feature? Why does the system need it? If you're starting from scratch and writing it from um, scratch in a standalone application, how would you write this feature? How would you design it? What is the best way to design this feature regardless of the framework that it's gonna be plugged into? Um, if the way you would design it is radically different and better than the design of the old software, um, then I think you should design it that way and design it so that you can plug it into or plug the framework into the feature. Um, so getting into boundaries, um, just a quick note on the MVA framework. It's a framework that we use at Compose Systems. Um, again, I'm not trying to sell anybody on it or anything like that, um, just so people know what I'm talking about here. Um, it's all actor framework based, so it kind of um, separates out the UI and the business logic components of your application. So there is a viewable actor hierarchy and a model actor hierarchy. The models are the business logic, views are the UIs, um, and it all com um, communicates with each other over a mediated data bus. So this is a concrete real view for a real customer. Um, this is actor core, so the front panel of this VI would be shown. Um, what we have here is some um, indicators being bound to mediated data values. So there's an exhaust sensor in the system, a CO2 sensor in the system, and that sensor has a state, um, a line state. And what I'm doing with these function calls is binding the value of that control to um, that mediated data value. And the key thing here to notice is that every single one of these VIs is a VI from the MBA framework. These are direct calls into the framework. Um, so that's a view, a single view. Um, the MVA framework works with sub panels. So an end user application that you would actually look at is usually many views embedded into sub panels, sometimes well over a hundred. Um, I think the most is probably two or 300 separate views in an application. Um, so if you have say 200 views that are all calling into a framework directly like this, the chances of you ever moving away from that framework and that application are basically zero. You're completely glued to the application or to the framework. And which again, isn't necessarily a problem. It's just something to be aware of. Um, so the simplest way um, to create a little boundary is just by creating wrapper functions. And this doesn't necessarily have to be object oriented. Um, you take whatever function you're calling and you wrap it up in a wrapper that you own. You are the maintainer of that wrapper. That wrapper gives you the functional interface that you want. Um, that way, if you ever did need to change that piece of code, it's all in one place. So what I've done here, just a simple example, I've taken this method and just put it in another method that is now controlled by me. So if I had 200 views and they all called this method and I ever wanted to swap out this, all I have to do is swap it out in that one place. So that's a really simple way of creating a boundary. Um, one thing to note is that this really only makes sense if the function is something that you would want, the behavior is something you would want regardless of the framework. So this, this functionality, the binding of a control or an indicator value to some global data is something that I would want. And it's a really useful function. It takes the control reference and binds it in the background. I don't know how it works. I don't care how it works. 
Um, whether I'm using the MVA framework or some other framework, that's functionality that I would want. Now, if this input was highly specific to the MVA framework, there's no point in wrap it, writing a wrapper that um, is exactly bound to the MVA framework, because even if you get rid of the MVA framework component, you're still functionally bound to it. Uh, so that's something to just kind of be aware of. Another way to create a boundary is through what's called the adapter pattern, um, which is kind of the idea of a, a wrapper. Um, so from Design Patterns book, the adapter pattern converts the interface of a class um, into the interface that clients expect. Um, a quick note on this book. So for those of you, I think I'm guessing so a few people in this room are familiar with this book. If you're not, this book is an excellent resource to have. You can buy it for about 30 bucks on Amazon. Well worth the purchase as a reference guide. Um, it's a set of reusable design patterns. Um, one comment on design patterns, um, don't learn these things so that you can go look at your application and tear it all apart so you can use them, but rather learn these design patterns because when you have them in your head, it's like a repository of tools that you can then use when the opportunity comes um, to use them or when you have a problem um, that can be solved by one of them. So learning these design patterns is like adding to your tool set as a developer. So very useful book, highly recommend people buy it if you don't have it. If you don't wanna buy it, you can, I think just Google this online and there's lots of summaries of all the patterns listed within it. Um, so going back to the adapter pattern, um, quick example here, we at Compose Systems have an event logging framework that we use in all of our applications. Um, this is the event logger. It's got an abstraction around syncs and a sync is a place for an event to go to. So it could be a text file. It could be a string on a um, UI. It could be a console view. It can even be like a remote network endpoint. Um, it's just a general set of functionality for logging events. Now let's say you want to use the event logger, but you don't want your application to depend on it. Well, what you can do is create an adapter, which is a very thin class. In this example, I've got literally two methods in the class, log event, close log, um, that's it. And this is the class that my application would depend on. It calls this class, has no dependency on the Compose system event logger. Um, in this particular case, I've made the inputs the same as the inputs as the composed system event logger. Note that this type def is owned by the log interface. It is a log level enum. So there'd be you know, trace, debug, information, warning. Um, but this is different than the enum used by the event logger. Again, note zero dependencies on this. So then you create a child of this log interface that implements the composed log by wrapping up the composed logger. Um, so your interface code is completely separate from the composed event logger. As I mentioned, you could completely change the functional input. So going back here, um, the composed event logger log event method has these inputs, event level, event data, event source, and a timestamp. But if you didn't want those inputs or you wanted different inputs, you could. this is the place to make the function look the way you want it. If you want your event source to be a class, if you want it to be an enum that maybe you have a specific set of modules and they're defined by an enum, you can make it that. Whatever you want, you make this function the way you want for your application. Then in your concrete child, you adapt the inputs to be um, what matches this tool that we want to use. In this case, I'm just passing them straight through. Um, this is translating the one enum to the other enum that the composed event logger is expecting. And it's also doing a little checking on whether or not this should actually even be logged. Um, but otherwise it's just a straight feed through. But the point here is that if you didn't want these inputs or you wanted maybe say the VI call chain, um, you could add that input here and you format it however you want and then feed it into the event logger. So what you've done is kind of adapted the interface that you want to this toolkit that exists out in the wild. Um, so one of the limitations of that pattern is that it doesn't really work if the object that you want to adapt to is not being directly called. Um, so the example here that I could use would be an actor. Um, you can't really wrap up 
an actor in another class because you don't call actor methods directly, you call them through messages. And the actor is running in a um, separate asynchronous loop that you don't really have direct access to. So um, you can't really use the adapter pattern. However, um, there's other steps we can take to kind of decouple business logic um, from actors. So talking about actors, I love the actor framework. Um, pretty much every project I work on is uses actors heavily or is slowly moving in that direction, uh, meaning that when I add new features, I do it with the actor framework. Um, one of the reasons, I kind of want to take a quick aside to talk about this. One of the reasons I love it so much is that it implements the template pattern. So a lot of people talk about the fact that it's a command pattern, it's an asynchronous queued message handler, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think the fact that it's also an implementation of the template pattern is actually more important and the template pattern is one of the patterns defi um, defined in the design patterns book. Um, what the template pattern means is that you have a set of functionality that children of an object don't override. So actor core or actor.vi here defines some functionality that you don't override. Specifically, pre-launch init is the first thing that's called on an actor when it launches. Um, you don't change that. The fact that you, when you can override pre-launch init but you don't override the fact that it's the first thing that's called. Um, also, if pre-launch init returns an error, the actor stops and the error is returned to the caller. When you send a message to an actor, if the in queue executes without error, you know that that actor will either receive the message or the message will be handled in um, drop message core. Similarly, if a message executes and returns an error, you know that handle error will be called. Um, you also know that the last method an actor, actor executes that you can override is stop core. Um, another, another part of the template is that if an actor is launched by another actor, it sends the launching actor a message when it stops. So all of these are behaviors that you don't really change. And if you understand these, if you understand this template, it makes debugging actors super, super easy. And I've, and I've heard a lot of people say that the actor framework is complicated or hard to understand or difficult um, to debug. But I think if you really fundamentally understand this template and you understand the behaviors that are somewhat baked into the framework, hard coded, it's much easier to debug this than it is to debug some random queued message handler that you have no idea if maybe somewhere off in the background, the queue is being flushed or when it stops and there's messages in the queue, what happened to them? So you send it a message and maybe you're waiting for a response. All this undefined behavior is what makes code hard to debug. But with the actor framework, there's a template and you know how it behaves to some degree. And if you fundamentally understand that template, it makes working with actors so, so much easier. Um, so kind of getting into actually working with actors, um, a common use case is when you need some sort of asynchronous behavior, um, like an instrument driver, where you want it to try to connect to the instrument. Um, if it doesn't connect, you want it to wait and then try again. Or if it does connect, you maybe want to start polling for status readings um, and publish them, or maybe you want it to step through a series of commands, but you don't really care about when it does that. You just want it to do it in the background. Okay. Um, so a use case would be that you have this instrument driver that has these basic functions, initialize, take reading, set output, close connection. And often you'll want to call these functions both synchronously and asynchronously, meaning that sometimes you want the application to start up and you want this driver to just try and connect and you want the rest of the code to be doing its own thing, not worried about this. Other times, maybe you synchronously want to know whether the, the connection happened. Um, since I only have 15 minutes, I'm going to kind of step through these quickly. The idea here is that with each of these functions, you may want them to behave asynchronously or synchronously. Um, so looking at it from that perspective, it's easy to jump to thinking that we should um, have this instrument driver be an actor. Uh, but I think the better design is to have an actor call the instrument driver. Um, and a way to think of this is we have those function calls and then we have behavior related to the function calls, right? So taking the example of initialized connection, what we want, we want to call the initialized connection um, depending on what happens, whether or not the connection actually uh, 
um, is made or doesn't make, um, we may want to wait and then try again or notify some callers and actually use the driver, right? So there's the function call, which is initialized connection. And then there's the behavior around initialized connection, um, which is separate. So a way to think of this is that we could design a module that maybe if we break out the behavior here, we can think what we really want to do is call a function, depending on that function, either notify a caller or call the function again. So breaking that functionality out, um, I've designed a simple little example here of a, what I called a cyclic function actor. So this actor is pretty simple. It's got a few methods in actor core. It registers for a timer timeout event. And when that timeout event is generated, it puts a timeout on this event loop. And when the timeout occurs, it sends the actor a message. That message is right here. So we execute an injected function. Once the function completes, we look at the return code. We look at a set of injected stop codes. If the return code matches one of the stop codes, we stop. And if it doesn't, we generate the user event and call this function again after some timeout period. So using that, here's an example of a heater controller that is an actor. Um, but this actor, the behavior um, isn't implemented by this actor. It's implemented by an actor that's specific to that functionality of calling a function at a defined rate. So we pass it off. We pass this functionality off to this cyclic function actor. So we have a thermocouple interface driver. Um, we inject it into this cyclic function actor. We tell it to retry every second. And if the function executes without error, stop. Um, because the actor framework is a template and we know that when it stops, um, it's going to call last act. This is last act of the caller, that controller actor. Um, we can look at what was returned. We know that this actor only launches one actor, which is the cyclic function actor. So we can typecast it safely there, um, unpack what function it was executing. And if it was initializing the, if it was calling the initialized function, and it is returned, that means that driver is now initialized. And now we can kick off another loop where we just start reading. So this is the um, read loop where we launch, again, the same cyclic function actor with a read function where we inject the driver and a data return callback. And that function will be called periodically every 100 milliseconds until it returns an error or we stop it. And every time it's called, it's going to give us the data back on this injected callback function. Yes. Right here? Yeah. Yes. So this is a um, this function has a generic data publisher. So this is the function, um, the read. This is a function object that gets injected into the cyclic um, actor. This is the function that it calls. So it um, accesses the instrument driver, calls the read function. If the read function executes without error, it gives the data back to the caller on this abstract data publisher return. So this data publisher is not an actor. It's not an actor um, reference. It's a very thin class that has one method, which is uh, publish data. And so I've created an override for my specific actor that I inject the, um, Q into this override class, which is a data return class, and just send. So the concrete implementation here, and I'll, I'll show some code in a minute, um, just sends a message back to that actor to process the reading. Do you have a question? It seems like you're adding a lot of abstraction. So how do you balance adding abstraction versus confusing the heck out of whoever's looking at your code, right? Because at some point, right, so, so sometimes the abstraction is necessary and useful. Mm -hmm. at, at what point do you find it becomes confusing? That's a very good question. Um, and I'll, I think I'm going to get to it on the next let me, next slide. Um, so one note about this, this, um, this this design here is that it's assuming that the caller is going to be another actor because the way the callback works is 
through last act, right? So that's a design dependency. This really only works, is really only useful if the caller is an actor. Um, so you could take that design that I just showed and the controller actor, you could even abstract that and have a state management actor that kind of cycles through states, right? Um, whether or not that's useful or just making your code really complicated and convoluted is a question that comes down to, in my opinion, the application you're working on. If you have five totally separate instrument drivers where you want this behavior across all of them, then I think it makes sense to do that because the application is gonna be complicated enough that it's gonna take some time for you to, to know it regardless. And if you see that that's the pattern across five instrument drivers, when you learn the pattern, you kind of know how all of them behave. Whereas if you have five different instrument driver controllers that all kind of do the same thing, it's not necessarily gonna click as well that these are all doing the same pattern, the same behavior. Um, so the, whether or not to create that abstraction is really something that you just have to balance. There's been times where I've created layers of abstraction and I'm like me and I think most of you know John McBee are sitting in, in a room one time and we were looking at the code and we were just like, what the hell are we doing? This is insane. <laughs> and we, that was literally what we said, like, this is crazy. Um, and sometimes you realize th that those layers of abstraction actually are useful and trying to get rid of them, you end up with something that's just as complicated as not having them. That particular instance, we were talking to a motor that was moving and trying to track its movement. So it, it was complicated regardless of the pattern, uh, but it, it's a very good question to ask and it, it's something that I think only you can really decide. Thank you.